Japanese art in general is known for its, as your text points out, its asymmetry, abstraction, boldness of expression, and humor. So as we look at Japanese art after 1333 today, we will see, we will investigate these characteristics. Asymmetry, things not being symmetrical, abstraction, boldness of expression, and humor. So we'll be looking today at how Zen Buddhism influenced the development of styles of art in Japan after 1333. We'll also be looking at the themes of ukiyo-e imagery. Ukiyo means floating world. It had to do with um, the sensual pleasures of life, the realization out of <laughs> Buddhism that life is fleeting and temporary, and so one of the consequences was that people decided just to enjoy it while they could. So ukiyo-e imagery has to do with um, the floating world, those sensual pleasures of life, as well as We'll be looking as well at the imported artistic traditions from Europe and Asia. How European and Asian, um, particularly Chinese, art impacted Japanese art. So we'll begin with the Muromachi period. We'll see three different periods today. Muromachi, Momoyama, and the Edo period. So beginning with Muromachi, it starts historically when warriors of the Ashikaga family take the position of shogun, or head leader. And at this time, Zen Buddhism begins to um, gain popularity because of the samurai. They were very disciplined warriors, and Zen, which actually means meditation, entails very disciplined meditation. So disciplined warriors like disciplined meditation, and so it gained popularity. At the same time, the, the samurai were the ruling elite, and pure land Buddhism was still popular with the rest of the population. So pure land Buddhism had been uh, prevalent up to this point, but Zen begins to take the, come to the fore. And it has to do with, the, um, through the efforts of meditation, one can reach enlightenment. And this enlightenment is the realization in essence, that one is already enlightened. So it happens through effort rather than through some kind of um, salvation or um, the act of God in a person's life. So we'll see how Zen Buddhism impacts cultural production in Japan. And during this period, during the Muromachi period, a new Chinese style of landscape painting becomes important. So paintings these paintings were not colorful, unlike earlier Japanese painting, which had been very colorful. Instead, paintings like this one were monochrome, in the style of some of the Chinese painting we've seen already. And monochrome simply means one color. This particular painting is black and white, or has a very limited palette, maybe a little bit of brown. This is a painting by Bunsai called Landscape, and it's modeled after Korean paintings that were modeled after Chinese paintings. So here is the comparison with a painting we've already seen in chapter 5 uh, in this course. And this is actually a painting from the professional school as opposed to the school of the literati. So this was made by a professional courtly uh, artist as opposed to um, one of the literati. And some of the characteristics that influence these um, Zen landscapes are, are some of the things they try to exude are purity, loneliness, serenity of spirit. Excuse me. So both Bunsai, so particular, this particular artist, and another artist named Seishu were students of Shobun, who was an artist monk who was the first master of ink landscape painting. Now, I didn't show you any images by Shobun because his work did not survive, or at least no undisputed works have survived. Um, but another student of Shobun is Seishu, and he was able to go to China, and in China he studied works by court painters. Again, the professional painters, not the literati. And his style 
contrasts sharply with his master. Again, I don't have an image from his master Shoban. But what happens is after he goes to China, he comes back and he creates these very unique paintings, such as this one that has jagged brush strokes rather than the refined, delicate lines that we see in an image, like this one by Wunsai, who we can assume maybe was closer to his master. So another influence of Zen is the dry garden. Dry gardens were found in Zen temples and they were created for the purpose of meditation. For um, The monks would uh, use the garden as a tool for med meditation. They worked in the gardens, so part of their practice would be to uh, engage in act action, engage in labor, so they would clean the garden, they would rake the stones, they'd pull weeds, and this work was an aspect of their uh, practices as monks. On the other hand, they also engaged in contemplation. So contemplation was also really important. So it's interesting to think about life where it's not just work and it's not just um, meditation or contemplation, but you have a balance of the two and the two can help each other and fuel one another. Uh, lots of religious traditions uh, try to think about this balance particularly monastic traditions, and it's an interesting one for us as well as we try to find balance in our own lives. So in this particular garden, there are 15 stones. This comes from the 15th century. You see 1480 there. These stones could reference a number of different things. They, on the one hand, could look like, like islands emerging from the sea, or they could also look like mountains emerging from the clouds. So there's sort of a metaphorical reference to them. They also have borrowed scenery, is what it's called. So the like beautiful trees and foliage on the outside of the garden are also part of the experience. But the garden itself is characterized by emptiness. We've already talked about sort of the loneliness and purity of the landscapes, the Zen landscapes that were created in Japan in this period. But there's a purity to this landscape. And um, an emptiness and an asymmetry. So I mentioned that in the very beginning, that asymmetry would be a characteristic of Japanese art. Um, these gardens are very asymmetrical. And finally, Chinese landscape paintings influence the composition of these gardens. So once again, we have the importation of Chinese styles into Japan at this time. So now, next period, Momoyama period, and the art is a little bit different in this period. So the Ashikaga family declined from power in the 1560s, and so there was an ensuing period of warfare, basically constant warfare. So this period, the Momoyama period, is characterized by strife and warfare as different um, warriors vied for, for control, but a few different people began to be able to bring unity in three different warlords particularly. And we will see work from the periods uh, ruled by these particular warlords. A final, the final one being Tokugawa Iesu. So, he lived in 1542 to 1616 and was able to finally bring peace and unite the generals. So, Momoyama period, the arts really flourished and it was known for very bold, sumptuous palaces and temples. There was often gold leaf used in the paintings. Um, one artist who exem exemplifies the style of this period is Kano Itoku, who decorated a fusama, which is a paper-covered sliding door. And this is actually in uh, Dai Daitokuji, a monastery in Kyoto. And so the history of this particular artist, Kano Itoku, is, is that he's the grandson of Kano Masanobu, who began what became known as the Kano School. And that school actually began during the Muromachi period. So if you remember what we just looked at, the Muromachi period, 
We saw works of art that had to do with Chinese landscape and Zen Buddhism. Now turning the Momoyama period, so the Kano school began in the Muromachi period and continued on through the three periods we'll be looking at today. Momo, and so the second being the Momoyama period. So Kano Itoku was the grandson of the original founder of the Kano school. And it lasted, yeah, it lasted for about 300 years. Ended finally in the Edo, Edo period. So Kano was a family name. The Kano school was based on hereditary connections. And at the same time, though, many apprentices worked in the Kano school workshops and they helped produce the works of art that were very in high demand. And because of its popularity, other people tried to imitate the style of the Kano school as well. So in this image, we see a crane and there are a number of different trees. Pines symbolize long life. And in that sense, this image was influenced by artists such as Seishu. The characteristics we can just kind of point out with another image that's not in your text. Characteristics of the Kano school include uh, colorful, being very colorful, decorative, and large scale. Again, you see the gold leaf here. And you see the crane again. Um, so that uh, motif. So this is a little bit more indicative of the sort of colorful aspect of the paintings from the Kano school. What's interesting though, let's see here, okay, so in this period, we'll also look at the tea ceremony. The tea ceremony um, is interesting not just because it's a form of drinking tea, a way of people getting together to drink tea, but it also was a counterbalance to the turmoil and the violence of this period. So I mentioned that there were these warring factions in the Momoyama period. There were people trying to gain control as... Um, uh, as power decline, and that turmoil caused some people to want to react. They wanted something else. They wanted a relief from that. So we'll see how the tea ceremony is related to things being more natural, things being more restrained. It's calm. It's serene. This is this is something people greatly desire. That calmness. So. The tea ceremony is actually the word for it in Japanese is chanoyu. It's a it's a word we translate as tea ceremony, but our English translation is not a great translation. Um, chanoyu is the ritual of drinking tea, and Zen Buddhism had brought a style of preparing tea in which the tea is whisked in a bowl, which was new at this period at this time. So Senno. Rikyu is a tea master who developed the tea ceremony and he gathered his idea of the tea ceremony Chanoyu was to gather a few people in a rustic modest setting again very modest very simple this is the Taiyan tea room from 1582 and it sh shows that rusticity and modesty a Zen scroll or a flower arrangement would be found in the alcove or tokonama, and participants would quietly discuss uh, what was on display. And in the tea cer ceremony, the different implements were very important. So the tea bowl had a very particular aesthetic and a very particular style. You might notice that it looks rough. It's not refined. So this aesthetic did not call for perfectly formed symmetrical cups. Again, we talked about the, the value of asymmetry in general in Japanese art, and that carries into the tea bowl. Simplicity, very simple. It's based off of a Korean peasant bowl. Loneliness is conveyed. There's an irregularity. It has a cracked surface. It's very organic looking. The texture is um, the texture is organic and a little bit cracked. It's glazed to look like a landscape. It's fired with the raku style firing. And there's different num different aspects of its value. Its value is partly based on how it feels to hold it. So how does it feel in your hand? And who has owned it? So knowing who's owned it and the history of the tea bowl is also very important to its value but not its symmetry not its its perfection at all
So finally, in this period, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu forced the emperor to name him shogun. And then at that point, the Edo period began. It's the final period we'll be looking at today. If you can recall, I'm just reviewing these words, Moromachi period and then the Momoyama period. And the Momoyama period ex had these bolder, more lavish, sumptuous palaces that were painted, decorated with paintings. And then in contrast to that boldness, it also had the calm and serene and simple tea ceremony. But now we turn to the Edo period. So Tokugawa Uyesu forced the emperor to name him Shogun, and Edo is the name of the city he founded. Today we know that city by the name Tokyo. So society became more literate at this time, and a merchant class developed. While the merchants were ostensibly at the bottom of the hierarchy of social classes, their wealth unofficially gave them more status. So literacy was increasing, and everyone, including the peasants, began to be able to collect art, and we'll see the way that they could through printmaking. Printmaking was, was mass-produced, and so they were able to collect that. The emperor still lived in Kyoto, and in Kyoto, the Rimpa school developed as artists reinterpreted ancient courtly styles. So Sotatsu was the first great Rimpa painter, and during the Edo period, Rimpa is not the only powerful influential style, however. So we also will see how uh, styles and motifs from the rest of the world begin to influence Japan, which wasn't always completely open to the rest of the world. So, in particular, we have naturalistic painting that comes from Europe and the West, and then we have literati painting from China. So we begin with, with naturalistic painting. Are you able to see how this relates to what we saw in the Renaissance, and the Proto-Renaissance in the West? Um, what's important to notice is that there's um, a use of shading and modeling to create a three-dimension three dimensional figure. There's also a sense of perspective of the bull. He's almost receding into space. And then finally, the little puppy here adds humor, and which, for which Japanese art is known, as we've mentioned already. So that's the influence of the West. It's, a, it's bringing in modeling, three-dimensionality, but it's also in a very Japanese style and aesthetic. So then literati painting from China also made its way to Kyoto. And so Kyoto was independent of Edo. In a, in a sense. That's where the emperor was, where, uh, on the other hand, Tokugawa Ieyasu lived in Edo. So Chinese Taoism emphasized creativity and individual uniqueness, and that is what came to Kyoto, this uh, the Taoist um, value. And then in, in addition to painting being influenced by these values of independence, the tea ceremony, a new kind of tea ceremony also developed. And in fact, this became a form of political protest. Basically, um, people who wanted to protest the repressive shogunate regime would drink steeped tea. So it would, they would create, make the tea differently. And that tea was called sencha. And that was the tea that was drunk by the literati in the Ming dynasty in China. So that was why it was important um, to the Japanese. So it was a new style. The tea ceremony had developed many rules and was associated with the repressive shogunate. So this new style of drinking tea called senja was a form of political protest, if you can imagine drinking tea being a form of political protest. An artist who drank sencha was... Taiga, who reveals his personality with this, this particular painting. We talked about how Taoism ta uh, emphasized the creativity of the individual. And so this artist displaces individuality with, the, with very particular strokes. And he really offers a personal vision of a real Japanese place. And so let's now turn to ukiyo-e, which I mentioned in the beginning that we'd be understanding uh, what that meant. So in the 18th and 19th centuries, 
the city of Edo flourished. There were wealthy tradespeople who lived there, as well as the shogun. Buddhist thought at this time continued to remind people of the transience of life. So people had money to spend, but they also felt that life was fleeting. Let's enjoy it while we can. So the brothels flourished, restaurants and theaters did really well. And so all of these pursuits related to the concept of the floating world, and that is ukiyo. So ukiyo-e is the term referring to pictures of the floating world. And so a woodblock print like this one, showing uh, courtesan and her apprentice, um, was mass-produced, could be mass-produced for consumption. And we'll see in other lectures how these prints, once they made their way to Europe, influenced art in the 19th century when they're exported into Europe. Hokusai produced a series of 36 views from Mount Fuji in 1831. And this famous series was immensely popular. I think it's still a very famous print, this particular one. So here we see tiny boatmen. You can see them in here inside their boat, hunkering down. Um, they're pretty small as the wave engulfs them. The wave obviously is taking over the composition, the picture plane. And then there's a sense of perspective, the use of perspective in which Mount Fuji is depicted very small as it's, a, as it's farther away. And this this print was so popular that it continued to be made for years and years and years, and the block, wood block that it was printed with had to be recut. So finally, if you've ever heard the phrase, what is the sound of one hand clapping? If you've ever heard that phrase, then you're familiar with Hakui Nikaku. He's generally considered the most important Zen master of the last 500 years. And he taught himself to paint. His amateur paintings are appreciated for their charm and force. And he often would give away his paintings, uh, which he would do on scrolls. And he'd give them away so that he could get his religious message across to as many people as possible.